Hey, welcome to another episode of Accessibility Insights. I'm Eugene Wu, the CEO of Vengage, the most accessible design tool out there in the market right now. Vengage is like Canva and Adobe, except with baked in accessibility tools. So if you want to create accessible designs or documents from the start, proactively try Vengage. Right, back to the podcast. We're going to kick things off today with a great and grand welcome to our guest, Dr. Iyad Abudosh. He is the professor. Uh, at the American University of Kuwait, and with over 90 academic articles published, including some in the field of web accessibility and generative AI. Um, he's also a consultant and trainer on web accessibility and a member of the Arab Digital Accessibility Expert Group. He also has a podcast called Inclusion and Empowerment, an Arabic language podcast about accessibility and inclusion. Welcome, Dr. Iyad. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eugene. It, it's great, actually, to be here with you today. Great. So let's kind of start from the, from the beginning. Can you share with us how you began your journey into researching accessibility tools uh, and AI with accessibility in mind? Yeah, sure. Now, um, after completing my master's degree uh, in Jordan, I went to my PhD in the U.S., um, I went there to New Mexico State University. At that time, uh, my professor, uh, who were, uh, you know, identifying the topic that I'll be researching, he shared with me his previous research uh, papers, and some of them were about accessibility. My professor, uh, his name is uh, Dr. Enrico Pontelli. He's he's still there at New Mexico State, and he's mm -hmm. he's one of the best personalities I met in my life. So during that time. Um, he shared with me his uh, his publications, and then I read uh, them. I I like accessibility. So when I was reading, it was about different topics. You know, he he gave me papers about parallel processing, logic programming, accessibility, and so on. So I felt that accessibility is is more what I want because I feel that this is more beneficial for the people directly because I I like to to do things that you can see the effect on the on the benefits directly. So I, I felt that accessibility is, is one of these things. Now, at that time, um, I work with him on my PhD dissertation about non-visual navigation of Excel sheet uh, components. Uh, it was at 2006. Um, I'm not too old, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so 2006 is like two years before, right? So, uh, <laughs> so, so a that, short time ago. Yeah. So at that time, um, uh, we we analyze actually the three components of of Excel. You know, we have charts, uh, mathematical equations, and we have tables. So we 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 actually represent charts using a gaming device called Novent Falcon. Now that device you can use it to play games, but we program it in order to make the blind people feel the charts and it can you know give auditory information about the different information about the chart now at that time there was no nothing like this so we we and um and also we we did uh, the same software in order to analyze tables so it will uh, analyze the excel spreadsheet identify where is the table then identify where are the headings then it will connect them in auditory for ways to make it more accessible and also the same thing for mathematical equations. So at that time, I, I did that research and actually when we finished it, we uh, we did two passes of evaluation, one of them with university students who were blindfolded and another pass with blind school students. And uh, from that time, I actually felt in love with accessibility. So I, I, okay. I when I when I went back to Jordan, my my country, uh, I spent uh, some time there at my university and I did research, did uh, research grants also have been funded to do research on accessibility. Then I'm here now in, in Kuwait and I'm doing the same. So from time to, to time, I, I try to do some some uh, publications okay. in the area of accessibility. So, yeah, you know, that's, that, that, thanks, thanks for that, that journey. And, and you're right, 2006, that was just like a few years ago, for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to, and we, but brings me to an important point. You mentioned a assistive technology, uh, this gaming device. Uh, what was it called again? 
it's called yeah. Innovent Falcon. So it was like uh, it, it's like a mouse, but it's it's okay. it's not if it's a big device that has three degree of freedom. So you can you can use your hand to play. So yeah. for example, at that time when my uh, professor he gave me that device, he was in a conference and they were you know having that. So he bring it with him. So he give it to right. me saying, okay, play with that and see what we can do with it. Then I I was testing that, and when I was for example using that to uh, you know shoot with a gun on a game then right. you will be feeling the bullets coming out from the I device see. or if you for example play basketball then you will feel gravity so you need to push a little bit so so it has it has that haptic feeling and so Got it's it. like a, okay. it's like a mouse but it has a 3 degree of freedom so what we did Got with it. that is that we program it in order to make the people uh, the, the blind people actually, actually when they navigate the charts uh, to do navigation, but what we did at that research, we actually uh, first identify the chart type, and based on that on that identification, we identify the appropriate way to navigate the chart. For example, if it's a line chart, then it will take you, and if it's right. a bar chart, then you will be feeling something like this, and if it's uh, um, a by chart, it will be different. If it's a scatter chart, it will take you from point to point, and it's not only you know haptic touches but also it has so that device it's as i said it's like a mouse so if you click on the device it has like three buttons as i remember um so if you click on the device then it will one of the buttons will take you to the highest point if you click again it will start right. speaking for example the uh, okay. the summary of the chart and so on so it has kind of interactivity uh, in addition to the feeling of that and we tested that yeah. actually with the with a blind school and the students were happy with with using it especially because you know one of the problems in my opinion also when when it comes to uh people with disabilities especially blind uh people is that usually they they don't have the freedom to select the topic that they want to study because usually in schools they don't learn enough math right? so because yeah. there is no ex uh, you can say accessible solutions that allow them to do that right yeah, that that's that's a that's actually I I posted something I spoke to someone else uh, uh, that his name is Sean Jordison and he specializes in math ML which is a I don't know if you know math ML like yeah, it basically I, makes math yeah math yeah. I mean you should know I sorry I don't know yeah. why I said that <laughs> it makes math a lot more accessible and I did get some comments from uh, from uh, blind and visually impaired people that oh I wish that they had introduced math ML when they were in school because they didn't know enough math. Uh, and they couldn't pursue either their careers or, or could I had a comment they couldn't even pursue university because they didn't have enough math uh, right. uh, yeah, because it was not accessible to them. So so you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, uh, blind people face a big disadvantage because learning math is so difficult uh, without without proper tools. Yeah, especially because it's visual, you know. So now during my research, uh, the PhD dissertation I told you about, we we did several work uh, at the beginning uh, to convert the mathematical equations using MathML, but with the addition of we call them structural components. For example, if you have a fraction, then um, you have a part uh, of the MathML. It's actually not MathML. It's actually we we added some other parts that will make the component will tell you that this is the start of their fraction this is the end of the fraction so if you have a big formula let's say that have you know uh this uh, uh expression is divided by that expression then the blind person will not see that so he needs to to find a way in order to identify where's the beginning and where's the end and we allow the user also to do navigation through the the mathematical equation we converted that into uh we call it expression tree Anyway, so what I'm trying to say here is, yes, I agree that it's it's hard, but as as you said, based on the technology that we have currently, we can we can still um, add that to the curriculum and make it available for the students. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's kind of like follow up on that topic. So that you know, obviously, that research was you know a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are you working on now? I know you recently published an article around you know AI. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your current research, uh, you know, if it's AI or maybe it's something else uh, around accessibility. Yeah, yeah definitely. So my um, my two recent publications, uh, so one of them was about 
web accessibility automatic evaluation tools to what extent they can be automated. Now, at that research paper, what we did, me and my colleagues, we actually uh, analyzed the, uh, uh, the web accessibility uh, success criteria uh, to identify you know, uh, if they can automatically test it using current technologies. So mm -hmm. we, we analyze each one of them, and then we try to see if it's possible to automate the way of evaluating these different kind of criteria, success criteria. Now, what we discover is that 58%, uh, 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 just to be uh, specific, it was for WCAG 2.1, by the way. So okay. it shows that 58% of level uh, 1A, uh, we were able to identify that they can be, you can say, automated. 50% right. of level AA, and then 21% of uh, AAA. AAA, okay. Yeah. Now, our plan was actually, so what the, the goal of that research was we want to have, you can say, uh, a base for the work in which you identify what is expected from the tools. So what you can do next is you can use that baseline for you. So you can check the tools that you have currently in the market to see if they, ma if they matches the expectation, right? So if right. I say, for example, that we're expected that the tools will be able to automatically identify this and this and this and this as success criteria. Right. Then when I go to the market, I can check, okay, this tool is doing this, this this tool is doing this and this and this, but it's missing to do this and this and this, even though the technology is available and they can do it, but they did not do it. So, but we, right. we still did not do that phase of the, of the research. We are planning to do that next. Now, my other uh, research that I, it's actually accepted soon. So I received the acceptance letter before like one week. It was about the use of generative AI tools in order to um, develop accessible uh, web pages or web content, mm -hmm. you can say. So in that research, what we did is that we uh, use ChatGPT and Copilot in order to mm -hmm. uh, develop accessible uh, pages, but accessible pages for a specific content. For example, accessible page with uh, with a specific table structure, accessible page that have login form and so on. So we tried to provide a, speci a specific prompt and then we see if the tool were able to develop for us what we uh, expect as outcome for each one of these. Um, so yes, these are the, the, you can say, the most cool. recent research work that I have been working on recently. Right. So I have some questions with the uh, web accessibility testing tools, because obviously we all use, uh, you know, especially there's some free ones and, and some plugins. Yeah. In your research, um, just to clarify, were you evaluating uh, actual vendors' tools or were you just evaluating what is possible based on the WCAG criteria? Now, as I said, we, we did not reach to the point in which we evaluate the tools, but we identify, okay. yeah. we, we analyze the success criteria, we, we, we identify the current technologies available, and then we try to see each success criteria if, ca if it can be uh, identified, let's say, or if it can be right. uh, evaluated, let's say. Now, in that paper also, what we did is that we identify the uh, tools or the evaluation tools that has been used in the literature uh, in the last five years, right? Right, uh, right? When I say in the literature, it means the research papers, okay? So we cannot say that this has been used by the, the majority of the developers or by the people, but we, we are talking about the uh, academia or the research papers. So we find that, for example, that a checker wave uh, TAW, right. these were the uh, three or the top three, you can say, tools mm -hmm. that has been uh, cited uh, in the last five years. And we identify also uh, the reason why why the people were selecting uh, these tools. So why they selected a checker, for example, uh, based on the on the people uh, comments on the or the feedback that they provided in their research. But as I said, the, the, the next step will be that we will do actual evaluation for the tools. But this is a huge right. project because uh, in this case, you need to go through the uh, different tools and then you need to go through the, you can say, the expected uh, outcome for them based on the research that right. we did. 
And and what is so so you you mentioned some number like fifty you know everything in all levels from A to um, the WCAG two point one A to triple A it was all like you know around fifty something percent or less and and it goes lower and lower. So yeah. what is your main conclusion on automated testing? Is that you know is it and now that you're doing some research in AI like is is that percentage, can we get more of that? Because that seems like only half can be automated. Can we get more of the testing done automated with AI or with you know current other things that, that you have in mind? Yeah, I think if we, if we uh, utilize AI as it can be uh, utilized, we can actually reach to a higher number. And if we actually tackle the problem in a way different than what we have currently. For example, currently from what I see is that most of the tools, what they do is that they will go through the code and then they will see yep. if there is missing, right? For example, if there is no alternative text, then they will tell you, you need to have alternative text. Now in AI, yep. you can take the alternative text, even if it's there, and then check the image and see if it matches, right? Using image right. recognition and so on. Right. But I, I was discussing one of uh, the, uh, uh, you can say the the people who are contributing to the uh, accessibility area uh, in the last year, I was in the M enabling conference um, and we were discussing the, the possibility of the usage of the huge data that the companies are using. For example, now we know that the companies that we have currently that they are doing accessibility, accessibility testing and so on, how they do that they use the manual evaluation as we you know uh, it's because the, the automatic evaluation will not catch more than 40% let's say of the issues right. now so you need manual evaluation you will use automatic to make it easier for you to identify you know the things that they can catch but then you need to do manual evaluation you need to use screen reader also testing now we were we were talking about the possibility of actually uh, using this data, this huge data that comes from different companies, if we can, and then we can use that in order to improve uh, the way of doing uh, the, the automatic testing. Like what? For example, here you have the screen reader evaluation, right? So you have the, the screen reader reading the content and you have the manual right. evaluation. So it's like you are having two pieces of data that if you utilize them in a good way, you will be, and if you have a lot of that data in the companies. Now, if you if you utilize that in a good way, you will be able to, to do automation for the testing in a way that has not been done before because you are relying on the audio, the screen reader, which right. most of the time it will be catching many errors that are not catched in other ways. And you have the, the outcome from the manual testing that has been done by the experts. So that kind of matching, if you have it, you know. Uh, right, right. With, with several, you can say, uh, instances, then you can identify the features that you can have here and there, and then you can do automatic. So, but I don't think any company did that uh, yet. So I am not sure because maybe they are doing that internally, but uh, I can say that this is one of the techniques that if we utilize it, I believe that it will be enabling uh, okay. improvements and enhancing for the accuracy of the results also. Right, yeah, so, so I think from what I'm hearing, uh, automated testing is still, you know, 50% or less. You still need a lot of manual testing and still a lot of work to be done. Uh, yeah. In, yeah, okay. Okay, let, let's move on to the other um, interesting paper that, that, by the way, congratulations for getting that paper accepted on, on, on like actually generating um, co accessible code. Uh, yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about like how far did the research go? Like, did you actually create some real pages with, with the code, uh, with with uh, with Copilot, uh, and in what when what kind of pages were they? Were they complicated pages like with forms, with tables and graphs? Uh, and yeah, so tell us about that that research because so, that sounds really exciting as well. Yeah, definitely. So in that research, what we did is that we. Uh... We start by identifying the components that we want to create. So we did not create actually complex pages, you can say. We created a page with one content that we think we need to check for its accessibility. And we, we feel that, that that content is is uh, is usually we have problem with that when we uh, uh, when we when we do uh, accessibility testing. 
like I said, we have tables, we have uh, forms, we have uh, tabbed, uh, you can say, uh, content, and so on. So we identify nine different, uh, you can say, components that we have for, for the pages. And then we then created the prompt that we will be using for ChatGPT and for Copilot. And what we did is that we, 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 we actually give the prompt and then it will generate the code. We take the code and then we see if it uh, matches the, uh, you can say the golden standard code that we mm -hmm. had there that is accessible. Now, if the code was not generated in a correct way, we do another prompt to correct it. And we give it a third chance if it did not work. And then we say, that's it. So we give it the, the foundation prompt, then more, right. more prompt, and then one last prompt. Now, um, as I remember, uh, uh, I think uh, ChatGPT uh, was uh, giving results better than uh, than Copilot in that. But what we did there, to be uh, accurate also, both of them, we use them, uh, you know, through the uh, free version or also through the their their website. So because Copilot, as you know, it can be used inside IDE. You can have right. it there and yeah. use it. But we use it actually as a standalone uh, version. Yeah. Okay. And and what's what's the, you know from your from your from your research? Do you think that using Copilot, you know, when in your edit in your IDE as you're coding? Is it helpful, like to as far as far as like getting the code more uh, more accessible or more compliant with with WCAG? Yes, I think so. If you if you if you are especially if you are using the uh, the copilot in your IDE, for example, if you use it as a plugin and so on, then you can actually ask the copilot to write codes for you and then you can tell it that you want it to be accessible for example in this especially right. if you are developing front end right or you are developing something right. that is related to the user interface so in this case you are ensuring that it will be uh, doing that for you but again you it, it's not enough in my opinion because you need to be aware of uh, what's happening so because sometimes it will be missing something or it's not doing that uh, one hundred percent accurate. So you need to, you know, uh, review it and make sure that it do that correctly. Okay. All right. Let's let's, let's kind of take a little bit, you know, higher level. Uh, uh, take it a little bit higher level now. Uh, so you've been back, you know, you've been um, back in the Middle East now for, you know, I guess for more than a decade now. Um, I kind of want to have a sense of how is the, you know, how, how does the, I guess, the state of Accessibility look like what does it look like in universities or, or across you know companies in the Middle East because I think even in North America where where I live um, yeah. it is you know there is some regulations now that are being enforced so there's a little bit more pressure but um, yeah. but it still has you know it's still a, a, a accessibility especially digital accessibility isn't something that is very well known outside of people actually doing, you know, the work uh, for, 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 for accessibility. And so I'm just curious, how does that look like in, in Kuwait or even in Jordan or, or in the Middle East in general? Yeah, definitely. Now in, in the region here, um, so when I came, went back to Jordan in 2010, uh, we did, did not have that much, uh, you know, information about accessibility and so on. But um, now, nowadays, I I see that there is going to we we are we are having actually growing awareness in in having more uh, you know accessible accessible products and so on. But still, it's not it it's not enforced in the region here. So if you go, for example, to Jordan to uh, other countries. Uh, it's not enforced. Um, the only country that I know they have that enforced, and it has been recently actually, is uh, United Arab Emirates. Okay. So uh, they 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 have that enforced right now, and it's a good thing to have. But other countries, they they have laws that you know uh, ensure that we have inclusive education and so on. But uh, when it comes to the ICT, uh, there is no enforcement of making sure okay. that the websites and mobile applications. Uh, are accessible, but as I said, the uh, the awareness is growing, and also people are 
um, starting to uh, you know produce these kind of accessible products. I uh, another thing that I want to mention also is when uh, when I went back to Jordan Jordan in 2010. In 2012, I work as a consultant in two different projects. The first one was a project. Uh, uh, by one of the NGO, they needed a consultant in accessibility to evaluate the websites of uh, universities and colleges at the specific uh, cities in Jordan to see if they are accessible, which was a good thing actually at that time. The other project was training for uh, developers in e-government, and this was supported by Microsoft at that time uh, okay. to, to, to help them to know how they can create uh, accessible uh, content. I want to say something here because, especially for developers, because from my interaction with developers, usually they, 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 um, their thinking about accessibility is that you are coming here to make our life harder. You want us right. to do more work and so on. It will delay the deliverables mm -hmm. that we are trying to produce and so on. But when they actually learn what does it mean and how they can contribute to that and what does it take to do it, they they understand that it's more about awareness and knowledge so it does not add that much of work you can say to the to the process it's actually it can be part of the process but it can ensure that the the, the product that you are producing is is inclusive it will take more time definitely but at the end it will add also to the uh, to the business value mm -hmm. i believe and this is what your company actually is doing which is which is you know trying to introduce a solution that is having uh, accessible product from the beginning. So from the start, you are trying to see if you can produce something that is accessible, which is great. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very, very good point. And the, the pushback from develop, not just developers, from, my ex from our experience, also from uh, content creators. So whether uh, maybe a teacher or an educator who has to create like a course or, or anything, any yeah. content creator, we get the pushback. They don't, you know, like is that it's yet another thing they have to learn. They have to change the way they do something. Yes. And so how do you, yeah, from, from your experience, you know, how do you get people to, re and then, and you're right, once they learn it, it's like, wow, like it wasn't that bad and it's actually very yeah. beneficial, but getting them across that, that, uh, that mountain or maybe yeah. that small hill, that's very difficult. What What is your experience or your advice to help people like us who are trying to get you know, developers and content creator to understand the value of accessibility. And it's not just extra work. We're not just giving them extra work. Yeah, my, my advice always is that you need to build the capacity of the people, give them awareness, and also introduce people with disabilities to the conversation. So if if they see that there is, there is for example, a blind person who is coming to the meeting and then they show them how they can actually uh navigate through a word file that is inaccessible they, they will see the frustration themselves right if they see an email that is inaccessible they will feel that okay this is very bad why 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 it's very hard for him to or her to do that so if they if it comes to emotional part in my opinion and they see that and also you, you add to that the capacity then you will have a culture change after that okay. That's 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 really really good, good advice. I think from our experience, it's it's also very similar. Once you can connect connect the work uh, with yeah. something real, uh, you know, then people understand. Oh, this is why I'm doing. It. So, so thank yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. Correct. Um, in in your work, uh, both as a consultant and and also a professor, I you know I, I'm sure you. You know, I'm sure you've had to remediate documents uh, or make a document uh, you know, accessible. Uh, yeah. You know, so t tell us. You know, and 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 you work you work in in Arabic uh, language documents. What are what are the challenges you face? You know, with an Arabic document versus a English document. Like, what are some of the unique challenges in making those type of documents accessible? Yeah. Now. This uh, so this reminds me of of one of the evaluation that I was doing uh, uh, with with a group of blind users, right? So we were doing this research on a mobile, and one of the survey questions was, "What is the most hard thing 
that you face and you you would like to make it solved okay so this one 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 important thing that you wish it's solved okay. and at that time all the answers for the blind community were we wish that the arabic pdf is accessible I so, see. So, okay. so this this was in 2013 i believe okay okay so so in 2014, after that, I proposed a research project to get uh, funded uh, to the government. It's, it was about, uh, we call it semi-automatic uh, generation of uh, digital talking books for Arabic language, which was actually using DAISY format, right? So going back to your question, what are the challenges that we face it with the Arabic language? Now, Arabic language, for those who don't know, first, it's right to left not left to right. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it has special marks that comes in the letters. We call it the acritic mark. So in the top of the letter, you have a mark. For example, if you have the letter uh, ba, right? So we have a letter in Arabic ba, like B in English. So so the letter ba, it has, you, it can have, it, it can has what we call it fatha in Arabic, which make the sound go ba, or it can have bamme, which make it bu, or it can have kasra, which will be under it, which will make it b. So one letter, it has three sounds, depends on the uh, diacritic mark that will come above or below the character. Now, if you go online after the meeting, Eugene, and you search for Arabic scripts, you will not find there is diacritic marks in most of the text, except for uh, Quran, for example, uh, or other kind of scripts. But majority of the content that is available there in Arabic language, it does not have that. What does that mean? It means that if I give, for example, uh, Arabic text for TTS, you know, text to speech, right. it will be generating the, the sounds based on the current positioning of the uh, uh, words, but it will generate the sounds, you can say, maybe randomly or maybe based on the context, but it will not be correct and so on. So many problems right. will come from that, right? So I'm just giving you one problem, right? Right, so right, right. The, 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 the other thing that is different than English is that the words in the in Arabic language are connected. So if you have, they, there are some, uh, not words, uh, letters, sorry. So the letters are connected. Now, some letters, they are not connected, but the majority, you can say 70% maybe are connected. So you, when you look to the, word in Arabic, you will see that you have this letter is connected to that one and that one and so on. So when it comes to, for example, OCR, optical character recognition, it, in my opinion, it will be harder than the English because you need to have the delimiter that will identify right. where is right. each letter and so on. Um, so going back to the story that I started with, which is, you know, the, the blind people were saying that, okay, the PDF, we wish that this will be solved. So right. <laughs> I, I went, I went and did that, uh, research at that time we actually did it like uh, semi-automatic which means that we we had ocr api that will take the arabic pdf then it will convert it to text then we have we take that text we feed it to tts and then it will generate the audio files then we merge both mm -hmm. of them the text and the tts to create a format we call it daisy format daisy format for those who don't know what is that it's actually accessible uh, format for, for books in which yeah. it will be reading the content and highlighting what it reads at the same time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's definitely, so the Arabic script definitely is a lot more challenging than I didn't know that the, a lot of the printed Arabic materials doesn't have the, you know, the, the, well, I call the accents on it because I, you know, yeah. like other languages has at those as well, but, but the written, yeah. A lot of the digital stuff, they you know, without that, it will be very difficult to read. Because <laughs> yeah. you want, like yeah. you said, they just they are literally different letters, right? Yeah, you know, you know, for the kids when they are in their first years in uh, in the Arabic world, for example, first grade, second, third grade, yeah. usually their books they will have that, because the right. kids will not know the sound. But when right. you become bigger and bigger, you don't need that because from the context uh, you can say you can, you can tell. Say, okay, this, yeah, yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um. Yeah, and I don't know if you've used like the like AI to because I I do it a lot. Like you know, instead of OCR, I just upload the file to Chat GPT and and say, hey, just you know, either read it or summarize it uh, and all that. Have you you know, 
has very I need, recent I need, AI. I, AI. I need yeah. to try that in Arabic. I did not okay. try it yet okay. in Arabic. But yeah, okay, okay. Good, I was going to ask. Have you, point. Yeah, this yeah. is a good point. Have you, I, have yeah. you tried that because and I, see? <laughs> yeah, because if, if I tried that in Arabic and then it was excellent in doing that, I think my project can go into another level now because at that time we did not have that uh, tool, right? right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if the, the AI will be because it has so many examples. It's trained on so many. Like it would understand the context. If you say just like someone who's very fluent in it, it would understand the context of what that word is, uh, yeah. and then you know just recognize this. This is this letter based on the you know based on the experience, right? Based on but from, based on yeah, the training. But from, yeah, but from my from my uh, experience, I tried to give it uh, Arabic sentence. Uh, the the chat GPT until it uh, add the acritic marks you know the right. the sounds uh, that are yeah. above or below the letters it was not able to do that all, for all the letters so it did oh it really for, okay yeah for if you if you if, if, so you can say that we have like fifty characters it did it right. for you can say less than ten okay all right that's pretty that's pretty bad then I would say yeah <laughs> yeah okay okay all right so um. One another question I wanted to ask you is it's you know we we mentioned a lot about awareness and all that I know you have a podcast uh, called Inclusion and Empowerment Tell us a little bit about your podcast and you know why did you decide to start it and and what kind of what kind of uh yeah what kind of content or what kind of guests do you bring on Yeah definitely yeah yeah thank you for bringing that So I I was having this idea to start this podcast for around a year. Uh, by the way, I already posted six episodes for that. Okay. Um, so the goal for that podcast is first to uh, raise the awareness, you know, about about accessibility in the in the uh, uh, Middle East or in the Arabic region, you can say, because uh, many of the people they don't know um, what is accessibility, what is what does it mean to have uh, you know uh, inclusive uh, content and so on. Now, in 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 that podcast, uh, what I'm doing is that I'm I'm having meetings with people with disabilities, and also with experts in the domain. So I already met with, uh, you know, from from you can say from the six episodes, I met with uh, some blind people who are uh, raising the bar. You can say in terms of of, okay. of the skills that they have. Uh, one of them is working as uh, uh, web accessibility expert. Another person, he is actually a uh, uh, news presenter, presenter in Jordan. So he comes on TV and so on. And he reads the news using Braille. Um, and uh, a third person, she uh, she's working in, in Egypt library and she's one of the people who, uh, you know, support the use of assistive technology and so on. Um, one of them is is actually a sign language translator. He's uh, in a channel called Al Jazeera. I don't know if you know. Uh, yeah. that, that it, it's a famous channel. Yep. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 So so he's 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 the main person who's doing uh, sign language translation. And when Qatar was um, having the World Cup, he actually helped in uh, creating the with 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 uh, another institution in Qatar called Mada. So he helped in the creation of avatar that do sign language during the World Cup. So they have oh, like automation yeah. for the sign that. So, so th there is there is some uh, you can say uh, work is happening in the region here and there. But again, I'm trying to raise the awareness about the importance of of accessibility. And from all these uh, people that I met, all of them they uh, focus on the importance of technology and the importance of education. So they are saying that. Education is the key. We need to to educate the people with disabilities in a better way. Uh, you know, deaf people they need to uh, not being uh, uh, learning uh, less. You can say content comparable to other students. The same thing for the blind persons and so on. So, the education was the key, in my opinion, from all these interviews or the meetings that I had with them. But yes, the, the podcast. Is 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 one of the things, in my opinion, that can raise the awareness and maybe make a difference. Thank you. Very, very cool. So yeah, um, so thank thank you very much uh, again for for this wonderful interview. And if somebody wants to check out your podcast or 
you know, learn a little bit more about your work, um, can you just tell us real quick what the chan what the what the podcast is called? Uh, the channel is it on YouTube or or somewhere yeah. else? Yeah. yeah, yeah, YouTube. Yeah, it, it's okay. on YouTube and also in the podcast, uh, you know, different platforms. So if they search my name, I Y A D A B U D O U S H, Iyad Abu Dosh, then they find my YouTube channel, and there, there, they will, they will find also the the podcast. Okay, very cool. Yeah, so check out uh, Dr. Iyad Abu Dosh's uh, podcast for sure on YouTube. Go, go uh, search for him and 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 give it a listen. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much again. This is this has been great. Thank you, Eugene. This is great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Right.